Good afternoon, everyone. And this is George Soto, and you're watching Startups Unedited. Today, I'm joined by Arjun Pillai, who is founder and CEO at Incent, which is a new conversational marketing technology startup. Arjun, how are you, man? I am doing very well, George. How are you doing? I am doing fantastic. I am so in love with your company and the space that you're going after. You know, you've seen some of these big uh, incumbents over the years, live person. There was this other one that that I just had like a V1 of the space uh, that I'm blanking out on right now. But in recent year, you, you've seen folks like Intercom and Drift and those sort of uh, companies really sort of like lay the path, I think, for this conversational marketing space. Uh, before we go into some of the details, why don't you tell us a little bit about your career background? How the hell did you get into startups, this crazy world? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, an engineer by education, I graduated my <clears throat> undergrad in 2010. And then uh, I worked with an IT services company for a little bit of time. And this was, I was back in India at this time. And I, I always wanted to do something of my own. That's all I knew. You know, it's not like I come from a kind of a village background in India. So startups and those kinds of things are not really uh, mainstream or even heard of. So I didn't actually know the word startup for a long time. Um, but then having this notion of doing something of my own pushed me into starting something. And that's how I ended up starting uh, my first company. This was back in 2012. I was 23 at that time. Uh, along with three of my batch mates back from college, we started off this company. And I ran that company for about four and a half years. Uh, we built like several products. The first four of them failed uh, as usual. And the fifth one started getting some traction that ended up being a customer intelligence solution used by about 110,000 users on a B2C front and about 200 companies on a B2B front. Uh, we scaled the team to like 72 people, raised a couple of rounds, went through accelerators. Uh, you know, that whole thing happened. And then I sold that company to Full Contact in 2016. Nice. Uh, following which I moved to the US because they wanted me to and took up a leadership role here in the headquarters in Denver, Colorado. And I was there for a little while, um, again, resigned, consulted for a, a uh, few companies about nine months and then started Incent. I'd say end of 2018, starting 2019 timeframe is when we started Incent. Um, I have my long-term friend, Prasanna, who is my co-founder now. Yeah, so two of us started this company and we've been running for just under two years now. Fantastic. Well, first of all, congratulations because I've been doing startups for 20 years. I've started 13 companies and uh, all of them have failed. And after the last one failed, this was, um, we tried to pivot in 2019 after going in a particular direction for three years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that just drains you, man, like emotionally, mentally, psychologically. I literally had this moment where I was sitting in Berkeley crying my eyes out with my co-founder and, you know, around the corner from our office and, you know, we were trying to raise money. We had been bootstrapping it for the the first three years, which really takes a drain on your finances, yeah. uh, it turns out. And, uh, and so we had raised a little money, but it just wasn't going well. You know, it's like after so, so long. And at that time, it was I was probably, you know, pitching VCs and those sort of things for you know, 12 years or something now. So I had a lot of relationships in the space. And I thought that because I'd been doing it so long, right, that it was going to be different this time. And you know, it turns out, you know, everything always changes every couple of years. I think the market changes. So I really kudos to you for that. And congratulations. I know full contact really well. I worked at Twitter for, for a while. There you so, go. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So let, let's talk a little bit about the transition from being a systems engineer, a technical, you know, stakeholder to, to CEO. I know that CEO is the hardest role. How yeah. did you sort of like what you do? how did you make that transition mentally, tactically to really become a successful uh, CEO founder? Yeah. I mean, like I said, I started at 23. The systems engineer is just a title. It's a fresh grad job. Right. So your job is to, in my case, was configuring SAP reports for my customers. Um, so moving to CEO, CEO is a huge title, like a loaded term, and it can mean 
a, a lot of things. But when you start a company, or at least when I started the company, I didn't try to be a CEO. I was just one of those guys. The way I think about startups, uh, George, is in a startup, there are only two things that you can do, right? Either you make or you sell, right? Everybody in the company, pick up one of this. If you are not trying to do one of this, then you are not needed at the company. That's how I think, ruthlessly in the first phase, right? So I was selling. I, I don't know to code. I'm a technical illiterate in coding. So I leave it to my co-founders. And I was fortunate this time and last time to get good co-founders who knew coding and they could make me a rocket ship when I tell them to, or I tell them, here is how it should look like. And they would actually make it happen, right? But I could take that and take it to the market, which is what I learned over the years. Um, so I wouldn't say that I became a CEO. In fact, I have written a blog post about it um, mm. that, I became a CEO, but it took me one and a half to two years to actually become a CEO, right? What that title means and how, what does that entail? It took me time. So that transition is a gradual one. And then if you have seen things before, so it, again, you know, I think about there are two ways to start a company. It's a very rough theory. Uh, one is to start when you are young and stupid, right? <laughs> That's what I did. So you're super young very stupid. You don't know what you are getting into. You just have a lot of energy, right? You just jump in. That's one way you can do it. The other is old and wise, which is you have seen things. You have 10 years, 15 years of experience. You have a network. And then, so depending on which larger bucket that you belong to, um, either you grow to be a CEO on the job. In both cases, there is enough learning curve that you have to go through. But if you have seen it, then you have some background. Otherwise, you are just starting from scratch. Um, so to make that transition well, I think good co-founders is important. Good mentors is important. A thought process of continuous learning and self-awareness is probably very important. Just understand who you are, what you're good at, and more importantly, what you're bad at. And then kind of get the right people around you to uh, help you guide and also fill the rest of the skills that you don't have in the team. That's awesome. I've, you know, I've heard similar things from successful founders around, don't try to be something you're not. Don't try to be the technical leader if you're not, right? Fill in that gap and focus on what you're really good at. And, uh, and that's how, you know, a bunch of successful people have told me they've, they've been able to scale in their career. You know, you mentioned mentors. What's your opinion on like advisors? You know, yeah. they, sometimes you'll see a bunch of advisors on a cap table and you're yeah. like, and I've done this before where I called up like someone who was really, you know, had a nice title and, and was, you know, popular. And I was like, Hey, I'll just throw you some advisory shares. And it didn't really help. What's your, but, and, but, but sometimes it does. What's your kind of take on that? What's been your experience? Yeah. I have never been, uh, at least I, I never had like a big name as a mentor, right? Like I have, have had the good fortune to have good mentors, but these are people who were operators and who have been there and done that ahead of me, right? So I would rather take a mentor who can give me some time and give his wisdom than the brand name, right? So I would always go for those and I wouldn't take a ton of them. I don't think being a CEO or a founder in general, you can engage with like 10 mentors, not possible, right? You have your investors to take care, you have your team to take care, who all, who all will you go after, right? So I think you can do like two, maybe three mentors uh, in, in different aspects, one helping you in a little bit on operations, one on the product strategy, one on culture or something like that, right? You choose whichever you want, pick one or two people who you can have continuous interactions with and that's, that's how I do with my mentors. Uh, anything more than that, I think is difficult to manage and you might not need it. Then you also outgrow mentors, right? Like as you go through, if your mentor grows with you and if that person can scale with you in terms of the, your needs, right? Not seeing their qualification, right? They might be experts at getting a company from 1 million to 10 million. Now you are at 40 million, right? Now, you have to go and look for other people who have done 40 to 100, right? So that's what I'm seeing. Um, so you may outgrow the skill sets of your mentors, uh, which in, that, in those cases, you move and, and keep figuring out. 
So my thing is don't look for the mentor who is at the sky level, right? Look for somebody who is ahead of you by like just five years. That's fine, right? People, if you are at hundred thousand dollars in revenue, find somebody who has done ten million dollars in revenue. That person can tell you a lot. And awesome. then once you get to ten million, find that hundred million guy. Or girl. I love that. You know, if you think about the journey that you've been on, and now you've had an exit, you started a couple companies, you've had some failures. What is it like being a startup founder, particularly from that journey from like the idea on the napkin to let's say about seed stage, maybe Series A, but let's say seed stage, because that that's a that's a quite an quite an adventure, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And you know this, uh, George. <laughs> it is incredibly hard. Right? That's that is the underlying common denominator. You do it for the first time or the thirteenth time, it does not get that easy. There are some things you get easy. You have some network. You know, there are probably a couple of investors who are willing to trust you. Those kinds of things will maybe improve when you do from second to third or fourth or fifth companies. But the thing overall is incredibly hard. Right. And the first phase, in my opinion, is the most exciting and the most difficult, which is about identifying a problem, a juicy enough problem, which when well solved, will get you a business. Right? That is a very, I mean, that's also exciting because once you solve that and get to product market fit, then it's more about operationalizing things, scaling things, growing things. So it's more of, uh, you know, doing it again and again in a systemic way. But this phase is where you have to put all of your creative hats and come up with different ideas, hypothesis, and keep validating. So this phase from zero to like seed stages, in my opinion, um, your success in that phase is most dependent on the number of hypotheses that you can make and the number of experiments that you can run to validate or invalidate those hypotheses. Let me ask you, when do you know it's time to call it quits. You know, this is, I found this to be very hard many, many times. And in the reason, and let me add a little more cult, uh, context in that, let's say you're, you have a little traction, you have a little customers mm. and you're like, Hmm, we're moving in a direction. And, and, and then, but it's not massive. It's not really real validation. And of course, validation seems, or the definition of validation seems to have evolved for me over yeah. the years. And so you just kind of wake up in the morning, you're like, oh, we got one more user. But is right. that user even valid? Does that even matter? Those $20 that they're paying us, that unit economic ain't going to work. You know. So when do you know, like, yeah. hey, it's time that this thing's not going to work. We need to move on. Yeah. It's a very, very difficult question. You know, honestly, uh, I mean, uh, I've done that. I've I've moved on from products pretty quickly. Um, so I have done that successfully. But if you ask me what is the science that I took there, it's very difficult. So my suggestion to, or my advice to founders when they reach me uh, is, hey, if you're unsure today, tell me a timeline that you feel comfortable, where you think you can run your hypothesis and get to results. And they'll say, some people will say one month. And I say, are you sure in one month you'll get somewhere? They'll say, oh, no, 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 three months. Okay. Or somebody will say six months. Anything above six months, I wouldn't recommend, right? Even if you are starting at zero, I feel that you can, given how many APIs are out there, given everything that you have out there in terms of services, you can build out some MVP in four months is what I believe. And then validate in two months. So anything uh, greater than six months, if founders tell me, I will say, no, you don't need that kind of time. So the actual time is somewhere between two months to six months. That's how much you can attribute, right? From today, okay, let's say you are going to take five months. We agree on that as founders, right? The second thing that I ask is, what is success at the end of that? We have to decide now, right? And what does the leading indicator looks like towards that? At the end of fifth month, 10 paying customers at $5,000 ARPU, is that the right thing? If that is the right thing at the end of third month, where will you be, right? So you agree on these things. And then at the end of fifth month, if you are not there, then yeah, quit. Got it. Right. Or the other way to do it is how much money you have. How much are you willing to spend on this? Mm -hmm. How many months of runway will that get you? Okay. That is the end time because you need to have enough runway to move on to from this product 
and still have six to nine months to validate your next one, right? So those are the two things, two decision-making frameworks that I tell founders in terms of when to move on. Got it. Thank you for that. That, uh, you know, it's interesting. I think about my my own experiences with that and what I've seen. And it's so easy to just fall into that black hole and just keep spending, keep spending, start putting on credit cards, you know, all that crazy stuff, which I don't recommend at all. So uh, founders out there do not do that. Uh, definitely, definitely try to use third party money. In my opinion, maybe you can use some of your money, a very little, uh, you know, depending on your financial situation, of course. Uh, but most of us starting off, we don't, you know, we don't have uh, the the capital that maybe a Peter Thiel starting a new thing would have, yeah. right? Uh, so, you know, if you think about the con- the current conversational marketing landscape, mm-hmm. like what's your take on it right now? And, and you know, why, why is a, a company like Incent really uh, flourishing right now and has been able to find that kind of sweet spot in the space? Yeah, um, I am a big believer in the real time uh, buying and selling motion that is happening across the world, right? And I still think that we are um, at the forefront of this whole moment, movement happening. COVID has accelerated it quite a bit, right? Because there are no booths, there are no workshops, there are no conferences. So the websites are becoming the booths in some form or fashion. So I believe that chats for all kinds of interactions, whether it is marketing, whether it is sales, whether it is support, whether it is recruitment, all kinds of interactions, I think chat is the, chat will occupy a, a big part of all those conversations. I'm not saying email is dying. I'm not saying I'm going to kill email, none of that. I think email will continue to uh, exist in a pretty big way, but chat will take a pretty good chunk out of the emails into this real-time paradigm. Um, and the reason why Incend is succeeding or, or on the way, hopefully, to a, to a success is because we have, I, we, we have segmented the market in a good way. There are a lot of chats and chatbots and so on and so forth. So Incent today is a B2B conversational marketing platform for mid-market and enterprise companies who are selling high, high ACV products and they, they have buying committee to sell to and they have longer sales cycles. So our product is purpose-built or custom-built for those use cases, for the account-based motions, for the deeper collaborations, for with, the, with deep integrations to their marketing and sales stack or their workflows. You know, and the system is crafted to be easy to manure. It is a set and forget platform. You know, so there are a lot of these things that we have built right into the system because we have been right from the scratch, we segmented that this is the segment that we are going to go after. Right. People come and ask us, hey, we are a B2C company. Can you do it? I'm like, we don't do for B2C. Startups say, do you have a startup plan? We don't have a startup plan. Which we all of which meant that we had to struggle even more to get our initial customers because being a startup selling to a mid-market or an enterprise company is not easy. But we decided to take that hard route because that's where I see um, a lot of void. So today we operate in that uh, paradigm and we can, we will continue to operate in that segment. And today I think Incent is probably one of the top two or three, if not the one for that segment. Awesome, congratulations on that. Are you hiring? Is, you know, if anyone wants to maybe get in contact with you about career opportunities, kind of where's the sort of, what's the state of the business right now in terms of, uh, in yeah. terms of those aspects. Yeah, we, we raised around uh, last year, second half of last year. We announced it earlier this year. So for some time we didn't announce. Um, so yes, we are hiring. Uh, we are hiring pretty much across the board, I'd say, uh, sales and marketing and product and customer success. Um, the, the team is growing pretty quickly. We, were, we grew like four times in the past five months, something like that. So it's definitely on, on the ramp and I feel really good about accelerating. Uh, as a founder, right, you have that view of where things are going um, and, and yeah, it, it all looks super good. So yes, we are hiring everybody. Please reach out. Always looking for amazing people. Um, go to incent.ai, I-N-S-E-N-T dot A-I or write to careers at incent.ai and would love to speak with you. Awesome. And for any investors out there, 
uh, definitely take a look when uh, when the incent is uh, going to be doing a fundraising in the future. Maybe, maybe not, but uh, well, I'll definitely want to uh, take a look and send it to some friends when you're available. Sure. But uh, thank you so much, Arjun, for your time. Very much appreciated. If folks want to like follow you on social media or or maybe check out that blog post that I that uh, that you mentioned, uh, what are some good handles to reach you or channels? Yeah, yeah LinkedIn uh, is uh, is probably the best. Um, Arjun Pillai. Um, if you search for me, then you should find me. There's also a Medium link. I am trying to write. I've been pretty silent on Medium for some time. But yeah, LinkedIn is probably the best way. Um, yeah, and, and I'm pretty responsive on LinkedIn as well. Awesome. Email is also okay. Arjun at Incent.ai. I'm very responsive there too. Cool. Well, have a wonderful day. Thanks so much. Thank you, George. You too.